Okay, we're live. Welcome to Dive into World Building. And today we are talking about what I call scaffolding science fiction and fantasy vocabulary in context. And um, I guess nobody else calls it that. <laughs> well, I'm but, still not sure what it is. So but what I'm it? talking about is uh, when we're writing in genre, we have lots of words and new concepts and um, you know, sometimes conlangs and and all kinds of stuff we make up that we want to sprinkle into our story and our world. And um, and sometimes that can be really easy to understand, and sometimes it can be really hard to understand. And what makes it easier to understand and what makes it harder to understand and how can we do a better job uh, as writers supporting the vocabulary that we want our people to learn? Because it's clear that people can learn a lot of new vocabulary, right? I mean, there's a ton of vocabulary out there floating around from Game of Thrones now, um, you know, that people are, that a great number of people are familiar with. Um, so yeah, so I thought that would be something interesting to talk about. Uh, you guys use made up words in your work at all, do you? Um, yeah, sure, yes, okay, like names and stuff, right? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think it's very common, and it's actually one of the markers mm -hmm. that, um, you know, one of the markers that you're in a, a genre world in the first place is you know, the kinds of names people have and the names of towns and the names of that kind of stuff. So could I sort of jump in and take one step back? Sure. If I can mix my metaphors there. Um, to Before we can really talk about how to, how to throw these things in in a way that's positive for readers, we should talk about what the readers want. And the readers of science fiction and fantasy and to an extent horror, uh, generally look for a different thing than a reader who picks up a mystery uh, or a reader who picks up a romance um, or a Western, whatever. The, the, they read for different things, like the, that sense of wonder uh, that people keep talking about mm -hmm. is a big deal. And one of the pleasures of reading science fiction or fantasy is figuring out the world like a crossword puzzle or, you know, um, and that, and there are a lot of readers who are genre readers by which I mean, science fiction fantasy genre readers uh, who really like being thrown in the deep end. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of readers of um, other genres like like mystery uh, who might want to pick up a science fiction book or, or Western and they don't like being thrown into the deep end. Or literary fiction readers, they, they read for other things. And so, um, so the question, the, I guess the first question is for whom are you writing, right? Like Anthony Burgess's biggest novel is still, you know, A Clockwork Orange, and he threw everyone way into the deep end with a vocabulary that was largely Russian, and the part that wasn't Russian was sort of Anglo weirdly anglicized Russian or weirdly, like, telescoped words, right, mm -hmm. you know, or, or strange. And the edition I had uh, that I read did not have, as the original did not have, the glossary at the end. Mm -hmm. I had to figure out what was going on um, and I was about five or 10 pages into it. I was following Alex perfectly, pretty much, you know, all the words. He was very careful to use them in context. So that's an example. It's an extreme example of actually a mainstream literary writer writing for, you know, a mainstream, mostly mainstream audience, successfully throwing all the readers of every genre expectation into the deep end and doing it a way that wasn't off-putting. I mean, it's a real, it's a real well, study in how to do okay, that. Okay, but I'm going to argue with you a little because I don't oh, think excellent. that people who start in writing a story necessarily give any thought to who they're writing it for. Really, like, I do. No, I, I want to, I want to back that. Uh, I want to back Cliff up on this, which is that I think that as genre writers know, we're writing in genre. I think that there are occasionally people who come in, wander in as non non-readers and non-fans of the genre who suddenly decide to write a story like this. And, and I think that 
some of them adopt our our native idiom and some of them don't. And so what's interesting to me from a production point right now is that I'm part of a crit group that has some science fiction fans and writers and has a significant proportion, actually a preponderance of people who write in other genres, mm -hmm. whether that's writing a sort of lit fic that's grounded in union politics or writing mysteries or writing historical fiction that has nothing to do with the kinds of things we're used to in science fiction and fantasy and horror. And it's interesting to me that the things that we take for granted as science fiction readers in this particular decade at this point, we take things like replicators and um, faster than light travel and certain kinds of, of ideas about, you know, uh, orbital mechanics and things for granted. We take the, the function of an airlock for granted and we don't necessarily explain all these things. And if we actually ex took the time to explain them, we are gonna lose our genre readers. I don't think that any of us as fans of science fiction want the, the writer to explain an airlock to us. Okay. So I, I hear you, though. Uh, what I'm actually going to be talking, what uh, the parts that I'm talking about are not actually explanation. Right. I mean, explanation has its has its role, but that's not where we're going with this. I think we want to distinguish between tropes and assumed technologies and um, conlangs and unusual uses of already established words that have been repurposed for other things. But okay. for instance, I, I, when I, when I write that something came out of a matter box mm -hmm. for everybody who's reading it, who comes from a science fiction background, even though that's my word for it, everybody figures out what that means, that it's some kind of replicator technology. Neil Stevenson uses a different word. Star Trek uses a specific word. Everybody's using certain words, but when our concepts are already laid down, it makes it easier to just slip in a word that says, this is my version. Sure, but I don't even think, that I don't even so. think that, you know, I mean, Star Trek just put one out there and showed you how it worked and then called it a replicator. And it's, and it's based, the word replicator is based on the word replicate. So I don't think, I mean, that is a but, form of scaffolding. But when I when we had this crit group and I had a story that had some touched very lightly on this and it was a side issue in the story, when I presented it to non-genre readers and they asked, what is that? And I said, oh, that's the word I'm using for replicator. And they looked at me and said, well, what's that? Right, because they had no and context for that. For the genre readers, it was obvious that that's what it was, though, is what I'm saying. Well, right. Yeah. So that's that's where the what is your audience comes in. It, right. You right. It's also about how much them. work your audience is willing to do to to sit there, look at the word replicator, go, oh, replicate is a word I know. Um, what are the consequence possible consequences of that? And what am I seeing in this in this story that might make that, you know, uh, comprehensible? And I do think there's different ways you can approach writing a science fiction story or a novel that caters more towards the more general reader, readers who have never or have little experience with science fiction and readers who have read lots of science fiction. And so the, you, the, the writer knows they're going to pick up these concepts because, and just get chucked in the deep end and just go with it. So there's, so it, it goes back to what uh, Kat and Cliff were saying about audience. So the amount of jargon you use and some of the basic jargon you can get away with for everybody, but some of the more mid-level stuff, some re like an Ansible. We, we, we probably all here all know what an Ansible is. And right. most moderate science fiction readers do, but a casual reader who's never read a science fiction novel is going to go like, what the heck is an Ansible? Right. And there's really not a lot of morphological support for its, for its purpose in the word. Right. So, so mm -hmm. there, there, there are levels of how, 
how you can frame the, your vocabulary for a different audience. This is this is separate from it's just invented words that that are idiosyncratic to your own universe. But there are some yes. basic terms that leave it as general or more advanced two hundred one level science fiction that you should consider. Right. So so for. I guess it's like well, are you? Are you writing this simply for the people who are aware of the entire history of science fiction up to this point um, as a sort of a continuation of an ongoing conversation? Mm -hmm. Or are you assuming that this is going to be read by somebody who may, who may not be aware of that history at all? Well, I think that's a decision you make. Even if, even if you are assuming a genre reader, at some point you are going to have readers, you might have readers who do not, cannot have all of the history that is required to support some words. There are just Absolutely. too many books. And if you have someone who's who's 15 and has only had, you know. I, right, kids are always starting afresh. <laughs> but, yeah. But I, I, I think using the kids as your tabula rasa is a problem. They're, they're no, they're not tabula rasa. They're, using, they're playing video games. They're using science fiction tropes all the time. But they're not and getting... mythological tropes all the time. And so... Yeah, but they don't I speak the same much, language as, as long-term genre readers. I think they're much more adaptable to going, I don't know what this word is. This game I'm playing uses language that it's just coming up with, you know, a term for this weapon. I, but I can see that the function of this thing is it's a weapon. And even if they don't understand the etymology of how the game designer named that thing, they're much less likely to be thrown out of the world and say, well, I'm not going to read this because I don't know what that thing is. Okay. We're, we're, we're looking at two different, right. two different systems here. One is video games and TV shows have an element that they can use to add context and meaning that that in words, in the written language, you have to draw the pictures. But if you have if you have a video game and you say this is a a, a what's it, and they can look and see here's the picture, here's it in act, the thing is in action. This is this is what you've got. The replicator, you know, it's, you can say this is what it's doing. If you have if all you have is words, then you have to draw those pictures with the words. So. So what I'm trying to say here is that, it, I, I, and I know that bringing in video games opened the door to this particular line of discussion, but mm -hmm. my, I'm looking at the kids, that, the, the things that my kids were until very recently reading, because they've just come out of a middle grade reader context. They've aged out of them. But those books have all sorts of wacky, fantastical, magical realism elements now. Mm -hmm. They're much more common than they used to be when most of us here were children. And so, you know, they're reading How to Train Your Dragon and they're reading all sorts of, of genre work as, without really thinking of them as genre because it's no longer the sideline stigmatized yeah, art. Yeah, that's anymore. true. And so I think that the, the question of how are you capturing your young reader is not actually the heart of this particular thing, I think that the question becomes, at what point do, do you need to do the parenthetical of this is what this thing is, or do you just slide it in? Which is the same thing whether you're using made up science fiction words or things that are not English. Okay, so. So, you know, when I say tortilla, do I actually need to say a flat, bread like i mean i don't think yeah i mean but, but that's not the point no. here that's not the point we're not talking about whether we need to stop out and explain a thing so there are definitely instances in which you have to stop out and explain a thing and maybe right. that's maybe that's um where we should start when do you stop out and explain a thing well it has to be something that you cannot reasonably expect anybody to understand and it also has to be something that you figure is really important to understand if you want to see how the story works. 
I mean, you can write a story pretty easily without explaining faster than light travel, right? You just say, here we are. <laughs> I, I, I have literally had to spend 30 minutes because I had people in crit who just was like, were like, well, how does this work? And I would say, it's not important. Think of it as like a magic wand. We're just gonna go on and they were just stuck. And this is why they're not genre readers. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but so so people with people with tolerance for ambiguity and a tolerance for not quite understanding everything and feeling perfectly tied down not just a tolerance there's some people who that's what they're reading for well sure but i mean yeah. like i think that as we get older we our 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 tolerance for that decreases because mm -hmm. when we're yeah. kids when we're really tiny we don't understand a darn thing Right. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, every everything that we encounter is basically new. And then we build we build up the context that creates meaning for things over time. Right. And then at a certain point, we go, OK, I got this. I've got it down now. I, I think that's a personality difference. And I don't think that's age based. OK. But I mean, everybody acquires language at a certain point. Well, so when I was a kid, there were a lot of kids' stories about a gr grown ups who'd forgotten how to be kids and had forgotten how to see things as kids. And all of these stories were written by grown ups, but they were cautionary tales. Like, don't become the kind of grown up who is rigid in their thinking. And I think a lot of people do become that kind of grown up, but a bunch of people don't. And genre readers consist of both, right? I mean, there are, there are genre <laughs> readers who read for comfort a lot of the time, mm -hmm. or even all the time. Um, and there are genre readers who read for discomfort, right? Like un that sense of unsettlement. But I, yeah, well, okay. I'll but call it well, sometimes I mean one and sometimes the other, yeah. Yeah. Sense of discovery. I wouldn't necessarily call it discomfort. Some people okay. don't find That's it uncomfortable. Fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're seeking it out, right? You know, then mm -hmm. it's clearly something you're seeking out. <laughs> um, so I, so I still believe that in order to answer your initial question, the the writer has to imagine an audience with a certain tolerance for ambiguity or even a love of ambiguity or a lack of tolerance for ambiguity and a lack of love. Of ambiguity. Yeah. Like, like if, I'm, if I'm writing a book for hire that's, say, a Star Wars or Star Trek novel, mm. then my goal is probably to have it be about 85 to 90% comfort read, like read, this feels like Star Wars or Star Trek, and then about you know, 10, 15%, ooh, this is a cool new idea, that fits into the comfortable universe that the reader already knows, right? Whereas yeah. if, if I'm starting an original series that the percentage of, you know, comfort and familiar versus strange and unworldly is, is going to be different, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that they, there's a, they're, they're both valid approaches and depending on what you're trying to achieve as a world builder, you know, um, the ratio can be different. But I guess ultimately, we come back to your original point, which is how to smoothly integrate new vocabulary to the reader in a way that is not off-putting, but which, you know, allows the reader to figure out the world, right? Well, I mean, you know, if it, when people are writing um, academic papers, they invent words. Sure. And they have, and there are very specific methods that they are encouraged to use to introduce those words and talk about how they're going to use those words, even if those words are not original to them, but, right? In this paper, I'm going to be using the word this in this such and such a way, right? That, that's, that's a case of that being a specifically pedagogical moment where that's exactly the entire point of that piece of writing is to introduce these words and then to demonstrate in a very, very blatant way, as opposed to most of the fiction we're talking about writing here is, or reading here is about um, 
I, I mean, for, for me, because of the way I write this is where I think about this in terms of sort of first contact and what happens when you're dumped into a world where you don't know the language, which, you know, is my experience of being a, a three or four year old going to a school, a, a nursery school where I didn't speak the language. Mm -hmm. um, how do you figure these things out? And how do people demonstrate this to you? And what can you figure out by looking at it? And what is, what do you often come up with an incorrect idea of because you made an assumption, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you avoid the kangaroo problem where they're saying, I don't know what you mean. And you think it means that's the hopping animal over there. So these are interesting questions, but part of that is are you actually writing a story about the acquisition of that knowledge or are you writing a story where something else is much more important? And in that case, why are we naming the rabbits something as opposed to calling them space rabbits, which is that perennial discussion we have within genre, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, let's briefly have it. Um, if it's functionally a rabbit, you can just call it a rabbit without having to so you know what i think i think we're i think we're getting off on the wrong track here okay we, we're we're deep into something that it's not quite what i was thinking that we were talking about so sure. um so one of the parameters that that i want to put out there is the idea that the more you make up words the more you alienate a reader now that can be your intention right but the more the the less the the less English you use <laughs> for an English speaker, the more a person is going to be like, oh, "I got to figure that out," uh, or "I got to understand that." Well, how about we reframe that and say, "The more challenging it is for a reader whose primary joy does not come from that vector." That's a good way of saying it. Yeah. You know, um, Charlie Jane Anders. Uh, with her latest book, The City in the Middle of the Night. Oh, I'm, um, I'm glad you could bring this up. Made a that decision too. to do the opposite, where she took words that are familiar to her reader, like crocodile, and made them mean something completely different from a crocodile. Uh, and in an attempt to, to both sort of, in an easy way to keep the reader from like freaking out at all the new words, but mm -hmm. also, to, there is an unsettlement because you slowly realize that the words that are familiar don't mean the familiar things at all. The crocodile looks nothing like a crocodile; it has tentacles, and you know, I mean, it's yeah. Um, and uh, similarly, the podcast, the wildly popular podcast, "Welcome to Night Vale," mm -hmm. takes advantage of the audio medium to uh, where where Cecil, the host, says word like "cat," you know, or uh, all sorts of other or dog park, things that, that are familiar to the listener, but the, but the listener can't see it, right? And if they could see it, they would realize that he's talking about things that are completely not a cat and a, you mm -hmm. know, like cat, the cats have spines and they're, they're venomous spines, you know, and things like that, right? Like, well, what does a cat in Night Vale really look like? Yeah. Right? Things that he's calling a cat. So that's, that's the opposite approach, where you use a familiar English word and then you so to not be off, and then define it in a way that is alien. Right. Yeah. And clearly that's doing that that concept is doing well for Charlie Jane because that's that that book's at airport bookstores, which is like sort of the ultimate goal <laughs> of a fiction well, writer. I mean, and, and fantastic. Okay, so yeah. so okay. So um, I guess one way of answering your question is you could not make up any words. That's an option. Yeah, obviously. Right. Obviously, and one option is not to make up any words. But if you're making up a world, then you're either going to have to make up words or you're going to have to redefine words. Right? Because you're, mm -hmm. you're working in an alien yes. environment. There, there are going to be alien concepts here. Mm -hmm. uh, you, as the author, get to decide what words you want to use to express them. But the work has to go in somewhere. Yes. Right. Either, either, sorry, there's a bug flying on my face. <laughs> either you have to say, well, I'm going to say this thing is a cat. And, oh, and later, you know, you're going to have to figure out that it does not have the same parameters as an earth cat. 
right? That is one choice that you can make. Or you can say, well, you know, because it's not like an earth cat, I'm going to call it something a little different. Um, I'm just going to either add a, mo like add a modifier to it, right? So instead of calling it a cat, I'm going to call it a shadow cat. Sure. Right. So I had a, uh, I wrote a short story on an alien, like a water world. And there were cephalopod like life forms that I just called Kraken. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I used the, the word out of mythology to, uh, which, cause that's what the col human colonists, when they showed up, that's what they called them. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so this goes back to actually the sort of frame that I'm constantly writing from anyway, where choosing between a, decolonize or indigenous look at how to write this or from a, a what we're used to, which is a settler and colonizing framework of how to look at this, right? Because there are Australian animals that have names that are familiar to us now. But for instance, a possum in Australia and a possum in the US are- They're not the same, yeah. Animals. And if you start talking about possums, it generally becomes clear about three sentences in as you're describing the behavior of the thing and why it actually was important that, you know, you have a possum in here as opposed to a, a, a squirrel or a, a dog, right? Mm -hmm. that, that particular animal is a possum for a reason. As you're describing what that possum is doing, it becomes obvious whether it's an American possum or, or a, an Australian one, unless you have a moment of going, you have your character thinking it's really cute. And yeah. for, for the viewers who don't know what the difference is, uh, American possums are really large. They're the size of a house cat or possibly slightly bigger or smaller. They have a long naked tail. So people call them, say that they look kind of like a, a giant marsupial rat, right? Rodents mm -hmm. of unusual size are kind of a possums. Yeah. But the Australian version is this tiny, cute little thing, which is much more like a northern hemisphere squirrel. Yeah. Possibly mm -hmm. even like hamster size, small, cute, fluffy tails. And they literally genuinely are cute. Yeah. So when you describe a possum as cute, you have a moment of wondering as a North American, yeah, they you might have cute. a protagonist who's got a quirky taste of what's cute. <laughs> or are we in Australia where the possums are cute, right? So that that unfolds in how that particular creature interacts in your story, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing as any other kind of narration. It's the same thing as when you introduce food. And it's the same skill that you use when you're when you're writing food that's out of the context of your expected reader eater diner. Mm -hmm. What do you describe? Do you have to describe what a mango tastes like? Do you have right. to describe what an apple tastes like? I mean, I've had to have long discussions explaining what a a um, anjou pear tastes like to somebody who'd never had one before. But we have these assumptions that a pear tastes like a pear, right? And so I think that this is, I think it can become very confusing when we assume that it's because of the genre, as opposed to just acknowledging that what we want to talk about is what is familiar to the protagonist and what is familiar to the reader and how much distance you want between the two things. And do you want the reader experiencing alienation or comfort and a bunch of other elements there in addition to is the reader somebody who really likes the cryptography of a conlang right so. okay so assuming for a second that we are working in a context in which we would like to be able to make stuff up uh alienate as necessary etc um what do we do to make those terms more palatable? So one of the things that we can do to make a term more palatable is to use existing words and mix them up, right? Um, like crocodile in the city in the middle of the night. No, not at all. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> like replicator. Oh, okay, sure. Right? Sure. 
use terms people know more or less what they mean. You can also do that on a morphological level, i.e., you can say, oh, well, um, uh, well, so for example, as I'm, as I'm working on my novel, uh, my editor was like, you know, these people have high enough technology, they will surely know what vaccination is, right? And I was like, okay, but I'm not calling it vaccination because uh, that's based on the word cow and, and it's, it's got this very specific kind of, of meaning and relevance and cultural significance in our world. And I don't want to have that come in to my world because none of that baggage should be coming along, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a it's fundamentally about defining words by providing context for them, right? Um, but you want to control what context gets brought along. Um, so what I decided to do was call it um, inoculation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is another word for the same thing that we are likely to know, um, you know, uh, it's in a dictionary if you want to go find it. Uh, and, but I decided that, um, that a vaccine had to be then derived from the word inoculation because that was the one I was going to use. So, um, so in the Varan world, inoculation is inoculation, but a vaccine is called an inoculant. Right? Yeah. Fair. So what that's doing is using an existing English noun creating suffix <laughs> on an existing word to create a word that really doesn't by, by all rights exist but will perform the function that it needs to when you see it. Yeah. Especially given the way that it will be talked about in the story and the scenes in which it will appear, et cetera. It can be, it can be decoded. Like we were talking before about Ansible. Ansible doesn't have anything to be this able to decode. Exactly. Whereas inoculant, you can start to feel like, okay, inoculant from inoculation. Oh, I get what Juliet's doing. Right. So that's a sort of a morphological decoding uh, strategy, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was, uh, I had a story in a shared world that was set in like the ancient world. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. And in where there was like, it was like kind of like steampunk in ancient Greece. And mm -hmm. um one of the guidelines in the Bible for the world was that where we would use the word scientist, they would use philosopher. And where we would use science, they would use philosophy because that yeah. was the concept. Yeah. So scientific implements were philosophical implements in yes. stories yes. in that world, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good example. That's a really good example. So um, let's see. I had... Yeah, go on. No, I, I ran across something on uh, on Facebook in the last day, which I thought was so much fun, and now I'm I've misplaced it. Um, um, well, on however, a, I'll, I'll however, just say on a, on a similar note, like Star Wars and Star Trek again are very good at this sort of coming up with a word that maybe you don't know that even means something you already know, like in Star Trek, the turbo lift instead of elevator, but yeah. it's like lift. Yeah in the UK and turbo means fast. So you can put it together and think a turbo lift is a fast lift. Decoding, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And in, in star Wars, they, they fire blasters. Well, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it's a laser gun and it blasts things. So yeah, blaster makes sense. Right. Like that may have been used in science fiction prior to star Wars, but it wasn't popular. Right. A blaster is a star Wars term lightsaber. Right. Well, like a saber is a kind of sword and it's made out of light and you know, so yeah, they, so, yeah. So I wanted to. Like wanted to there was this thing that passed around on Facebook. Are you guys getting an echo? Because I'm getting an echo. Yes. Yes. 
Nope. Oh, I wonder if that means Cliff is providing the echo. Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, I'll yeah. I'll log off and. <laughs> Sorry, Cliff. <laughs> it's okay. 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 Zothras is very sad, but it is. Zothras. <laughs> Okay, so this thing I saw on Facebook, which was really interesting, is it was talking about how you can uh, you can take a phrase, uh, you know, substitute in a word, uh, and and have it mean something very specific. So, like for example, you know, stick an ed on the end of almost anything, and you can make it mean drunk if you say. I was a absolutely door knockered last night. Okay, how about now? Great. Uh, so I was talking about this thing where you can actually take a word, add an ed ending, put absolutely in front of it, and make it mean drunk. I was absolutely microphoned last night. <laughs> right. Uh, this is a, this is a thing that. What I discovered was that, that people were very surprised by it when it was floating around on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was worth mentioning because this is actually a really, really good way of scaffolding unusual vocabulary, right? Because it doesn't have to be door knocker or, you know, uh, penguin, right? It's, it's, it could be some made up word that you just stuck in there, but you will still get the feeling of that it means drunk. Because, Last night I was um, in the space bar and I was so ansible by the end of it. <laughs> right, exactly. So I just gonna note a thing about that particular meme that nobody actually addressed. Yeah. Which is that that is entirely about the assumption of that culture about what you're going to euphemize or to talk about jokingly. And so Sorry, what you're going to what? What you're going to euphemize or what you're going to talk about jokingly or what you need to conceal because it can't be spoken of directly or what you need an abbreviation for because it's a giant horror thing that needs to... We have the word zucked. Yeah. It's used a lot in social justice Facebook. Yes. Oh, so-and-so got zucked. We no longer have to have a long explanation. Right. So, you know, how do you explain that in the context of the story? Well, you can just show that that happened and then have someone explaining that that's what it was later. You can just have, you know, hey, where's so-and-so? Oh, they got zucked. Well, wait, I don't know that word. And to actually explain it in context and have your, narr your somebody explain it. I mean, there's lots of different ways to do this, but... I found it really fascinating that the assumption was that it would obviously immediately mean hungover or really, really drunk. Yeah, it's for like me, the, without, the, without the initial framing of making it sort of English language culture, that's not what it meant to me. You know, it's interesting though, because the phrase that you're talking about was, is I got blanked versus I was absolutely blanked. Yeah, well, there's also the joke of, you know, like that's what the kids are calling it nowadays, right? Which automatically means a euphemism for sex, which is a similar kind of thing. Well, oh, that... We euphemize lots of things, but what uh, the, the point that I was trying to bring up when I, when I mentioned it is that our language is very phrase-based, right? And what we tend to do is we tend to think of it as putting words together into a sentence when a lot of times what we're really doing is taking phrasal chunks and kind of smushing them into a framework. Right. right? I, I, we're not I, always using large chunks, but we often use large chunks. And, though, and especially ones that recur a lot can have pieces swapped out of them and borrow context from where the phrase came from originally. You make it sound like viruses changing DNA. It probably is. Who knows? Which is, you know, William S. Burroughs, language is a virus from outer space. So, so the, so the, so the phrase pattern is, uh, 
intensifier and past tense noun, yes? Not necessarily. It's a, I think it depends on which intensifier you choose. Right. Um, again, I think it's, I, I found it really interesting as I read it with the, the pattern in front of me and I'd have to go look for it myself too, is that I had more examples because of the particular social milieu I'm in of it meaning something other than uh, inadvisably in intoxicated. Mm -hmm. Using that exact phrase lineup. And for me, it was really revealing of context. It's all about the context. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. like 30 years ago, I read a book that I still remember this bit of. Um, the second book in William Gibson's Neuromancer trilogy is Count Zero. And the I might have even been chapter, I think it was chapter two, but it was that when it introduced the character Bobby, who's a programmer, the chapter was called Bobby Pulls a Wilson. And it meant, in, it, it becomes clear that pulling a Wilson means really screwing up while jacked into cyberspace in a way that mm. could permanently destroy your brain. And we don't, that, that phrase is never really explained, except that one point, he, Bobby encounters, I think it's the Finn, who's like a really old guy at that point, and um, and he says, Wilson, you call it that? I knew Wilson. And, and Bobby says, was he really stupid? He says, no, he was really smart. And that was all there, that's all you ever know about it. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but it had, his name had become this, this legend of like really screwing up. Right. So, uh, Bobby had no context really about who Wilson was other than to screw up. And, mm -hmm. and so that was all sort of laid out, I think very carefully. By Gibson in that in that novel. Yeah, well, I mean, pulls a blank is another one of those. It's almost like an idiom, but not quite. Right? It's sort of like a borderline so idiom. We have we have phrase patterns that we don't acknowledge in English, and I, I'm I'm realizing that. Wow, I've been reading a lot of Finnish grammar recently because it's it's very much like the case system. That Finns use that that Finnish uses for its um its nouns, but we do this for all sorts of parts of speech. And it's true that the ways in which we line things up, there are certain verbs, there are certain prepositions that cannot be used, however logical they might be, to express certain things because they don't express that thing mm -hmm. anymore, right? Even if you're going to climb into a rocket ship, you might just say on a rocket and not mean strapped onto the side of it. Mm -hmm. Because we have on a train and on a boat, because that's our pattern for, you know, and yet there's in a car. So mm -hmm. there, there's a whole body of linguistics that studies this and looks at when do we say one versus the other because, and when somebody comes up with a new technology, they, they try to claim that we should use it in certain ways. I mean, like, Photoshop completely, Adobe completely lost the the fight over whether or not you would say something had been photoshopped. Mm -hmm. yep. And now it's become abbreviated and people will say it got shopped. Mm -hmm. Right? Like like yep. Xerox a generation before. Yep. So we do a lot of trade naming things, but what patterns we follow are part of this sort of inchoate mass cultural decision that gets made. <laughs> and I think that there's an interesting place when we're writing in genre where we might think we've created something completely plausible and the reader is thrown out because it hasn't actually fit the uncodified cultural guidelines well enough. You know, we still say hung up for calls that we make on, mm -hmm. on our little devices. And we're not actually doing any hanging or upping. And we but, still say call, even though that was originally you would call on someone once you showed up at their door. But I mean, we can't. Right? We, yeah. Sometimes we try to invent a thing. Oh, he, he rang off. And that will work for some people, but not for others. Mm -hmm. And if we actually say slid off the thing, sometimes when we try to over describe the action that's happening, we create things that become anachronistic. 
where for a while everybody had a flip phone so it made sense to just follow the star trek convention and sort of close the conversation off in some way right by folding up your device and now nobody folds up devices anymore except for real stalwarts so <laughs> now your piece looks really anachronistic and old even though you're writing about a future yeah um i i seem to recall reading some kind of vintage science fiction that talked about party lines mm -hmm. or Very you know cool. there's, there's 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 a whole stuff about how you share a phone number and so I think this is an interesting part of world building where how much do you want to discuss your technology or your your created concepts so, because how is that going to age your story in the long run? And are you writing the story to just fly off the airport shelf that week? Or are you hoping that somebody's reading it in 50 years? Do you care? Well, yeah, and how much and how much does it matter if the story is a little dated, you know? Because I don't think you can remove context. That's the problem. You can't remove context from the story. You can try, but you won't be able to get it out completely. Have you tried reading uh, any of the early Gibson cyberpunk it now? It's, um, just, it's really weird because he actually talks about data quantities. Yes. Uh, what is it, six, 16K of hot RAM or something like uh, that? Something like that. And I just, RAM. ROM. I, I, uh, I think but the worst is no cell phones, right? Like one of the creepiest scenes in all of, of Neuromancer is cases running through the airport and payphone after payphone is ringing because the AI winter mute is calling him because it knows where he is. But there's payphones, and Gibson himself said, that was, a, you know, miss that one. <laughs> so... Uh, but you know, I mean, like like Pat Cadigan in in her book, I think it's Sinners, invents the rave culture, and she calls raves hit and runs because raves hadn't happened yet in real life. And a hit and run, like a party that you just throw together and then the cops bust it up and you leave, uh, that's perfectly you know morpho morphologically makes sense, right? The 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 reader can take hit and run accident and change the context and understand that this is a improvised party. That's illegal, and right. So, and it's also, and it would also be, um, uh, it would also be previous to flash mob. Yes, yes. Yeah. And right. so, so she uh, she invents the term, and then like five, ten years later, raves become a thing in real life, and they're called raves. Uh, but that that doesn't mean the book is, you know, I mean, the book's dated on some level. It's a future that didn't happen, but it's still. I think makes sense to a, a modern reader. You can puzzle it out. I feel like not using the word rave or flash mob, for instance, and coming up with an idiosyncratic word that she, a phrase that she came up with, actually leaves that story feeling fresher than it would if you're trying to assume that modern phrasings go into the future. Well, you know, I think that you run into a problem with any time that you're talking about the future. Right, because um, the implies there's only one. Always in motion is the future. <laughs> right. I mean, so so you know, are we? This is partly why I don't try to write things that occur in the future, but um, it, it's only because there isn't one future, and you're not going to get it right. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, even the super super brilliant people you know, inspired some stuff that then later came about and yay, but like missed rafts of other things, especially social contracts and things like that. Um, so, Wait, you're you know. Are going to have sexually available secretaries in the future? <laughs> oh, well, who knows? On the other hand, we call cyberspace cyberspace because William Gibson called it cyberspace. Well, but exactly. So that's what I'm saying. People fulfill these visions that get given to them. I, I, I mean, the des design of a lot of cell phones was because of Star Trek communicators. They saw that and they wanted that. And so that's why, sure. that why they, work, they start up as flip phones because that's what Captain Kirk had. Well, we have tablets because of... of of, um, of next, generation, next generation, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, how much do our USB devices look like those memory sticks they were using on Next Gen? Mm -hmm. 
Right? Well, I can't wait for Babylon 5 style data crystals myself. I'm looking forward <laughs> to that. So, but I mean, was Gibson the only one who was using cyberspace? I seem to recall that a whole bunch of cyber. Uh, he was, was, was not, but he popularized it with Neuromancer. I don't know if he invented it or one of the other cyberpunks did, but. But Neuromancer was what brought it into the vocabulary of everyday folk. As I recall from that time. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm that's, mostly that's what I recall too. Other points of, of... I want to talk about the fact that I, it constantly amuses me that fantasy and science fiction all assume that humans will always be drinking coffee and all humans drink coffee. But, but I, isn't that true? <laughs> I, I can make some cracks about coffees and coffee and, and humans and how we, some so, of us have to drink coffee to be human. Stimulant, um, stimulants of some kind seem to be universal. I, I think coffee is just the American default. That's why it winds up in every, all these uh, science fiction and fantasy novels, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so. For example, um, Arkady Martins, a memory called Empire, they all drink tea and there isn't coffee to be found. Yeah. Well, I think tea has a little bit more flexibility than coffee mm -hmm. simply because a lot of things get named tea. Yeah. Sure. But it also has a different purpose. Um, even, you know, and, and all of it's cultural and contextual. But even if you, if you limit it to just talk about me, you know, for a minute, I drink both of those things. I drink coffee and I drink tea and I drink them for different reasons and on different occasions. And I will okay. not. But I mean, that's part of what we get to do, right? Other. Right. We get to right. give a name to a thing and then we get to associate contexts of use with it. Yeah. In, right. in our stories. Well, that's another uh, Star Wars thing. They call it CAF, C-A-F in yeah. Star Wars universe. And any reader would figure it out from caffeine. Yeah. and coffee what it is but they can't call it coffee because it's a galaxy far far away well and then there's claw yeah but right? you're gonna run into and i'm i'm thinking out loud um you you're gonna run into assumptions that are made by people who who drink things for different reasons coffee is it, it's a stimulant it works very well as a stimulant tea for me, is not so much a stimulant as um, as a comfort thing, so, which coffee is not. And you're going to run into personal and cultural assumptions about what these things are. Context. I, you will never not run into personal step. and cultural assumptions. <laughs> and where do you I, choose? I pull this back one more step, and, and note that the reason I snark about it is not because there's a stimulant of of I have to wake up and so I have to do a thing. But because an extraordinary number of works actually talk about roasting and grinding and, and the smell, and I'm just going, wow, this is really fascinatingly consistent that you feel a need to create fantasy and space coffee. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's not ready. Kat, just as a side, if you find works that actually talk about grounding and roasting coffee in fantasy and science fiction, please send me the titles because I would love to read those. <laughs> uh, that's because I've never read that, and I would love to read that. Um, but the protagonist of my novel in progress is a tea drinker, so you know. But that's that for me. That's the fantasy element. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a coffee drinker. I have to sort of imagine. I, I, I know. I really tempted to write a story about somebody who's got a passion for fermented foods and is really, really frustrated because their local non-Terran environment does not foster the the right bacteria for a specific kinds of fermented flavors that they want. And Dude, I if think you write it, I will read it. That. I don't, I don't know out of that what else to write about this because that's sort of the elevator pitch is the story. The, the planet without kimchi. That sounds like a that sounds like a horror story well, to me. Okay. I live I live in an environment that takes over sourdough and mildifies it, and it's horrifying. Oh no! Keep <laughs> sourdough because, in theory, if you if you keep a sourdough strain going for a long time in the Bay Area, it becomes more interesting and complex and more sour and all these other things. 
And if you do it in places that are not San Francisco, it can be that your thing becomes more and more taken over by the local yeasts, which are not, and bacteria, which are not conducive to. Yep. That is, yep. That's, that's dystopic, Kat. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And I, I really was tempted right after the walls were painted to sort of paint my walls with a slurry of, of uh, sourdough culture to see if that would like imbue sourdoughness into my walls, but I don't think it would work. <laughs> I can't I, imagine that's never been tried. I I don't know. I I apparently my author insert stories are slightly different than everybody else. <laughs> I think that's part of the point of being a writer and having your own vision of things. Guys, we are we got so excited about this. It's 506 already. <laughs> no. So we're going to have to call it good for now. Um very interesting. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, yep, we will meet uh, on Tuesday next week. Back to the uh, original day. Thank you for being flexible so I could get my measles vaccine. Good, we, good. Yeah. We need you to be measles proof. Yeah. Um, everybody in my family is either vaccinated as children or both uh, vaccinated as children and boosted as adults at this point. So. Yeah. We're working hard to stay healthy anyway. Um, so thank you for your flexibility and I will stop my broadcast.